Hello everybody and welcome to another One History Help video with me, Mrs O'Neill. Hope this video finds you well. Get yourselves strapped in and prepare for a long one. Industrial medicine is a big topic. Get yourself some snacks, get yourself a beverage and be prepared to sit in a comfy seat or maybe, you know, have a lie down or something like that, possibly part way through. Uh, because like I said, this is a big one. This is where we're going to see a lot of significant developments happening. Lots of individuals as well. But luckily to supplement this, there is, of course, the individuals from medicine video, which you can take a look at because there are one or two individuals that I'm not going to mention uh, in detail in here, or there might be a couple of details that I kind of skirt over um, compared to the individual's video. So feel free to check that out. Hope you've got everything that you need. I'm nice and comfy. I've made myself a cup of coffee and I've got all my necessary refreshments around me. And my washing machine is also going at the moment in the background there. So hopefully it won't be too noisy uh, and disturb what we're doing. Let's get started. Let's take a look at an overview of what we're going to be having a look at. So yeah, like I said, it's a big one. Here's all the different little illustrations of what it is that we're going to be taking a look at. We're going to start, uh, start off by introducing what the industrial era was, what we mean by when we talk about the industrial revolution. We're going to look then, actually to most of you, it's for the vast majority of it, it's a lot of individuals. So we're going to look at Edward Jenner, uh, Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, because uh, I can't bring myself to pronounce his name as Robert Koch which is the proper pronunciation. But anyway, uh, we'll look at Joseph Lister, James Simpson, and then we'll get into all things public health because there are massive changes going on in terms of the factor of government at this time. There are loads of things going on in regards to science and technology at this time. Huge, huge, huge advancements in that area which are able to help these different individuals out. Let's get going. Let's get started with an introduction to what we mean by the industrial era and yeah i'd say this picture sums it up pretty nicely it's a lot to do with factories and making things uh, to be industrious means to be hard working so the industrial revolution in britain takes place between 1750 and 1900s and uh, those are not absolute dates they're not discrete dates they are dates that can be debated and many historians do uh, but if you were to like Google in general, the Industrial Revolution, um, every country goes through its own Industrial Revolution and it goes through it at different stages. Uh, for instance, the Industrial Revolution in America happens a little bit later than it one uh, that happens in Britain. Uh, the one in Russia happens even later than that. So Industrial Revolution isn't something that is unique to Britain. But in that time period there, 1750 to 1900, that is when we are seeing uh, a lot of the developments related to the Industrial Revolution happening. It is a very significant turning point in our history. Now, I'm really overemphasizing the element of British history there because for the vast majority of exam boards, and I'm struggling right now in my head to think of an exception, the medicine studies are attributed to British history. Uh, a couple of years ago, our government said that there needs to be some actual explicit British, <laughs> British, British history taught at GCSE, uh, which is why for a lot of you, one of your exam papers will be specifically about British history. Uh, for instance, if you're um, examining under the exam board AQA, like my students are at the moment, uh, that is exactly uh, where we see this come up. So that's why there's going to be a lot of emphasis here on British history. And that's not to say that nothing else is happening in the rest of the world. Loads of stuff is happening in the rest of the world uh, between these two dates. These are, you know, such significant dates in general. Let me just think about some other um, other countries. Oh, my gosh. France. France between 1750 and 1900 is going through significant turning points. The late 1700s is the time of the French Revolution, which has a huge impact on the country and changes the way that it is led, that it is ruled. Um, also in, uh, I've, I've just referenced them before, but America during this time, the period 1750 to 1900 is when we see huge levels of immigration over to America and essentially the expansion of the of white culture across America with uh, the lands of natives being taken away. And also in when we get into the 1800s, that's when we start to move into the times of slavery being abolished, the uh, American Civil War. And that's just two countries. 
You know, that's not even including, for instance, oh my gosh, um, Ireland. Let's think about something a little bit closer to home. In the late 1700s, actually the early 1800s, um, the, what we now recognise as the Republic of Ireland uh, becomes part of the United Kingdom. Oh, sorry, I just thought my cat was going to come in. So lots and lots of stuff going on all around the world during this time, but we are going to be focusing on Britain specifically. So this is where at this time we become much more focused on industrial and factory production. Uh, this is the time where we are very much focused on making things. Not only that, but um, as well as making these products, they aren't just sold in Britain, they are sold around the world. Um, I referenced it a little bit there when we were talking about the Americas, but also, you know, the early, the early period of the industrial era for us is the time when we are involved in the transatlantic slave trade. And the fabric industry is absolutely huge at this time. In Great Britain, we have a massive increase in our population from 11 million people at the beginning to 40 million people at the end. That's a massive, massive population increase. And that is partially based on migration, but it's mainly based on the idea of people are having more babies. And the reason people are having more babies. Oh, hello. Talking of babies. This is my little uh, fairy baby here. Jesse, can you get out of the way, darling? Because I'm trying to talk about the industrial era. Thank you, darling. You stand over there. Sorry. The reason people are having more babies is because people have got more money. Okay, people are more affluent. And that tends to be what happens in history when people are feeling more uh, secure economically, they feel more confident about expanding their families. I'm not saying that's the only factor in why people, for instance, in the past choose to have children. But in the industrial era, there is definitely a correlation between uh, feeling a little bit better off and people having more babies. With this increase of population, we see a massive change during the industrial era in regards to the nature of how our country works. In 1750, the vast majority of our country and our population were farmers. We were an agricultural based country. Don't get me wrong, there were towns. There have been towns in our country since the medieval times. But the idea of people settling and working actually in towns increases massively during this time. By the time we get to the end of the industrial era, three quarters of our population will live and work in the towns. Now, because so many people are moving to the towns and our, our population is growing so rapidly, one of the things that we see happens is massive overcrowding. And when we get to talking about public health, um, we will uh, understand this a bit more in terms of the impact of this overcrowding. This was a great time to be rich. This was a great time to be rich. This is a great time to be starting up businesses, uh, to be investing in uh, factories and so on and so forth as well. But it wasn't a great time if you were poor. Perhaps my comment earlier when we were talking about population increase uh, gives the impression that um, everybody was enjoying uh, a better economic life during the industrial era. Not the case. Uh, we are getting a real significant gap and divide between the rich and the poor in our country. And for the vast majority of the Industrial Revolution, we are ruled by a government where they have this laissez-faire, don't really care attitude. They really took very little interest in the lives of the poor. And that doesn't change until uh, the later 1800s when working class men are given the right to vote. Before then, uh, poor people can't vote. So the idea was, well, why would I bother what you think? You're not going to affect my position of power. So lots of inequality going on at this time. Um, I just want to chuck in here as well. This is the time of the British Empire as well. So, you know, I was talking previously about the idea of trade becoming a, a lot, lot bigger. The empire is a significant part of that. Not only are we trading out to these locations, we are also being able to get products in from these locations. And especially during Queen Victoria's reign, when the British Empire was at its height, there was that phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. It had a massive impact on the power of our country and therefore how much was able to be developed in our country as well. Uh, I'm making it sound like the empire was a glorious thing. In my strong opinion, uh, the empire really was not. The way that we treated people in the empire was absolutely disgraceful. And um, I hope that 
in any of you, if any of you have had any element of education about the British Empire, I really hope that that was a message that was put across, that despite the fact it was an, a demonstration of our strength and our prowess, it was also an example of uh, incredible levels of racism um, within the Industrial Revolution itself. We're going to kick off uh, studying medicine in the Industrial Era with uh, Edward Jenner. Now, some of you may well have looked at Edward Jenner at the end of your study of the Renaissance. He kind of, uh, where, where it happens, for me, it falls into the Industrial Era. He's looking at the late 17, you're looking in the 1790s when he's doing his work. So that's why I teach it as uh, kind of like the, the go-to beginning of the Industrial Era. But he does also have, as we're going to see, links with John Hunter. And I would have talked to you guys about John Hunter as part of the Renaissance study. So there's a bit of a blurring of boundaries here. We're going to look at Edward Jenner in two separate parts. First of all, we're going to understand better the illness that he was working with. And it was smallpox. I've said here it was a massive killer disease in the industrial era. Uh, actually, smallpox has been around for quite some time. Uh, for instance, Queen Elizabeth I, the final Tudor monarch, she uh, was blighted by smallpox pretty much her entire life. Uh, smallpox is something you can survive or could survive, as I should say, because as we're going to learn shortly, we don't have smallpox in our world anymore. But it was also something that had a very, very high death rate as well. Now, the only way to prevent yourself from getting smallpox in the early industrial era was to be inoculated with smallpox. Now, just to be clear, we hopefully remember that Edward Jenner is the guy who's going to be the discoverer of vaccination. Just quickly, let's understand the difference between the two. Inoculation is when you are given a weakened version of the same illness you are being protected against. Uh, an example uh, could be, for instance, the flu jab, for example. Vaccination, as we will go on to see, uh, is an example when, uh, sorry, is when you are given a weakened version of a similar illness to prevent you from getting a different illness. Uh, a modern day example would be when women have the HPV jab. They aren't actually vaccinated with cervical cancer, but they are given similar antibodies to that. But back in the early industrial era, the only way, the only method you could have uh, was to be inoculated with smallpox. So essentially you would uh, have an incision made across your arm, most likely. That's the most common place where it would happen. And what the inoculator would do, the doctor would do, is they would get a uh, kind of like a little flick knife um, and they would get some pus from a smallpox victim and just kind of smear that uh, smallpox pus into the cut, into the incision that was made. And first of all, this was a very um, expensive procedure to have. Uh, we're looking at £20 then. We're looking at £20 back then. Add a couple more zeros onto that and you'll get an indication of how expensive that would be today. And it was also a very, very risky process as well. It's very reminiscent of the use of herbal anaesthetics. So that's why I would have spoken to you guys about when we looked at medieval medicine. Inoculation with smallpox was really risky because nowadays when we are inoculated or vaccinated, a l again, a lot of things are taken into consideration to make sure the dose that you receive is an appropriate one. But that wasn't happening back at this time. So instead, you will have doctors who may well give you too much smallpox, might smear a bit too much of that pus onto that incision. And the result of that would be you'd end up getting smallpox. Uh, some of them might be uh, a little bit kind of careful with it, you could argue, and not give you enough. And then you just end up getting smallpox anyway, because you, you wouldn't have the antibodies in there. Just to be clear, I'm using the word antibodies loads at the moment, but people back in the industrial era are completely unaware of antibodies. At the time when inoculation is being used, there is no knowledge of germs whatsoever. Let's bring in Edward Jenner. So Jenner had begun his life as an apprentice surgeon, still seeing that apprentice, uh, sorry, surgeons are receiving their training through apprenticeship from watching other people from, you know, a bit of trial and error in a way. And he did that from the age of 13. So rather than being at school, he does it from the age of 13. Uh, he studies under John Hunter at the age of 21. Let's remember, John Hunter is a pioneer 
when it comes to uh, radical experimentation. Uh, and he is also an incredibly thorough medical practitioner. He has so much experience, John Hunter, and if you want to know more about that, either look at the Renaissance video or take a look at the Individuals in Medicine video as well. So with him studying under John Hunter, Edward Jenner is going to kind of really be instilled with these strong beliefs about the importance of experimentation in medical practice. Then at the age of 23, he began work in Gloucestershire as a country doctor. So Gloucestershire at this time would have been one of those places uh, which was heavily, heavily based on agriculture. And one of the things that Jenner noticed as his work as a country doctor out in Gloucestershire is he worked a lot with dairy farmers. And he noticed that milkmaids, the women who milked the cows, would often get cowpox, and which is understandable. If you're going to work closely with a cow, you're likely to get cowpox. But what he did notice is that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. So although they got cowpox, it was very, very rare for them to get smallpox. And therefore he wondered, oh, there you go. Uh, sorry, that was my cat flap going. He wondered, is it possible that the milkmaids having cowpox have prevented them from getting smallpox? Can one having one disease stop you from getting another similar disease. That is what he wondered. And he wants to test this theory. And he does so by giving a young boy, an eight year old boy called James Fitz, he gives him cowpox, much in the same way, make the incision, smear in the pus. And then later, a couple of, I think it's a couple of weeks later, he then gives James Fitz a dose of smallpox. And lo and behold, Jenner is proved correct. James Phipps does not contract smallpox. You may be wondering why a child of eight years old was the uh, go-to person to experiment with on the uh, for, for Jenner, why an eight-year-old boy was his first experiment. Well, it's because eight-year-olds have almost like a blank canvas when it comes to an immune system. So they are of, of an age where, in theory, they wouldn't have caught lots of other illnesses to produce antibodies in their systems. Again, yes, we know that they don't know about antibodies. Jenner himself doesn't know anything about germs or anything like that. But nonetheless, they would have been aware of the kind of illness rates within children. And how if Jenner wants to prove that having cowpox can protect you from getting smallpox, he can't pick a child who has already had another illness, another disease because that would muddy the results that he got. He needed to have someone who had a perfect health record to be able to prove his findings. Like I said, he's proven correct. And, you know, much in the spirit of John Hunter would recommend, he repeats that test on 16 different people. So he repeats it time and time again, and he is still getting the same results. Now, knowing that his process worked, Jenner decides to name the process vaccination after the Latin word vacca, which means cow. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned here is um, you couldn't die from cowpox. So straight away, this process is a lot safer than inoculation. It's a lot safer because you can die from smallpox. You can die from being inoculated. You can't die from cowpox. So that was one thing going massively in Jenner's favour here. Jenner publishes his discoveries in 1798. And this is where we start to understand a bit about opposition towards Jenner's ideas. It's hard to imagine nowadays with vaccination being so incredibly common that people would think that vaccination is a bad idea. And I'm even saying that out loud and I've got a smile on my face because we know in a lot of countries we have got uh, anti-vaccination movements as well. People who think vaccinations are a bad idea, that they cause problems in other areas later on in life. Um, for instance, I remember when I was younger uh, and I was so I was born in the 1980s and um, I was given the uh, what's called the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps and rubella vaccine. And and nowadays there is some theory and talk around the uh, MMR jab uh, about how it could potentially have links to um, autism or something like that. 
So, yeah, I was going to say it's interesting, you know, like I said, you know, we are, this vaccination is such a big part of our lives nowadays. It's hard to imagine people opposing it, but hey, maybe it's actually not as hard as a, uh, as you think. But anyway, here we go. One of the reasons why people opposed Jenna's vaccination and weren't really big fans of it is that Jenna could not explain how or why vaccination works. He could prove it does work. He's like, here, look, here's several people that I have vaccinated who do not have smallpox. But he can't say why. And he can't say why or how it works because there is no discovery of germs at this time. When that happens later on, then vaccination will make perfect sense. But because he can't explain what's happening, people don't trust him. Okay, People don't trust him. But despite the fact that there was an element of uh, a lack of trust around Jenner, in 1802, the British government gives £10,000 to Jenner to further his research. Let's just remember that £20 was an incredible amount of money at that time. So previously, uh, inoculation was only available to the very rich. So let's just think how much £10,000 would be at this time. That is a catastrophically huge amount of money. But doesn't it show how much the government were getting involved in medical developments and seeing where they could make a difference here? Let's not go too over the top because we're still with, uh, dealing with a government that doesn't really, you know, give two hoots uh, about the poor. But nonetheless, rich people can be vaccinated as well. So £10,000 in 1802. And then in 1853, the government make it compulsory to be vaccinated against smallpox. A bit more in regards to oppos opposition to vaccination. We still, even in the early 1800s, have this belief that God sends illness as a punishment for sins. And so therefore, uh, a lot of those religious uh, arguments were that vaccination and to that effect, you could argue inoculation as well. But vaccination specifically was like playing God, that you're trying to do God's work. You know, it's going to encourage people to live a sinful life because um, they know they won't catch smallpox. So if God sends illness as a punishment, you can't try and prevent illness from happening. If you are, then you are playing God. Also, uh, doctors were losing a lot of money. Uh, that £20 to inoculate people, um, vaccination was far, far cheaper. You did still have to pay for it, even when it was made compulsory by the government. You did still have to pay for it, but it was significantly cheaper than smallpox was. Uh, also, you know, I talked before about this idea of people not trusting Jenner. Uh, there was also an element of snobbery against Jenner as well, that he was just just a doctor who worked out in the country with dairy farmers. What on earth would he know about high level science the such that he was putting forward? He's not a city doctor. He's not working with the huge populations of London or something like that. So a real element of snobbery towards him as well. And that kind of underpinned this idea of, well, you can't explain to me why it works and that element of uh, a lack of trust there. Many, many influential people, including the royal family, are vaccinated. Uh, we can also see an impact of vaccination in other countries as well. Napoleon uses vaccination uh, and also we have American presidents vaccinating their armed forces as well. Uh, I'm not putting it on here, but if you want to talk about long term significance of Jenner's work, in the year 1980, the World Health Organization, part of the United Nations, officially declared that smallpox had been eradicated from the world, basically meaning people don't get smallpox anymore. And it is very, very likely to say that that is all down and thanks to Edward Jenner. Next, we're going to take a look at what, uh, sorry, an individual that most people would probably regard as the most significant individual from our study. Uh, personally, I don't have that opinion, but uh, I know a lot of people who do. So let's understand a little bit more about this guy. He is a French scientist called Louis Pasteur. Now, more information about this guy on the Individuals in Medicine video as well, just so you're aware. Louis Pasteur is, uh, like I said, I think I just said that anyway, um, is a French scientist. And he is working in the field of um, food products and drink products as well. And around the time when he is doing this work, he 
is aware that many people believed that miasma or bad air caused disease. And some people believed that germs spontaneously generated when something went bad. If you want more on this theory of spontaneous generation, take a look at my section on Louis Pasteur in the Individuals and in Medicine video. Now, Louis Pasteur was able to prove that this was wrong. And instead, that germs were all around us and they caused things to go bad. Like I said, in that Individuals video, I go through this in a lot more detail, but in a very basic sense, Spontaneous generation theory is the idea that germs are caused when something goes bad, whereas Louis Pasteur said, no, it's the opposite. Germs cause things to go bad and that they are all around us. And he was able to prove this. And that's the key word here. He is able to prove it by uh, taking some sterile flasks into lots of different locations. So first of all, he had a control flask, so one that he didn't open at all. That was it was completely sterile inside. Then he took a flask and he went into uh, the centre of Paris, a highly populated city at this time. And he opened the flask and essentially just kind of collected air from the city in this flask and then sealed it shut. And what he noticed was uh, over a period of time, over a couple of days, weeks, probably, I would say more likely uh, that you could see germs on the edge of this flask. They were like kind of like black blobs around on this flask. And then he took another flask and he went up into the mountains. And he opens the sterile flask and does exactly the same again. And he captures the air, seals the flask shut, takes it back to his laboratory and observes what happens. And what happens is, is that the air in that flask from the mountain air also starts to show that there are germs inside but nowhere near as many as there was in the one from the towns. So by this, he's able to prove the germs are all around us and they are a lot more common in densely populated areas than in areas of nature. He is able to do this. And he takes this a stage further by, sorry, just looking to see what my next point was. He takes this a stage further by saying, not only can I prove that germs exist, I'm now gonna show you how you get rid of it. And he proved that the way you get rid of germs is by applying high levels of heat. So what he does is he takes the flasks that have got those germs inside them and he puts them over like a Bunsen burner. And he applies high levels of heat to them and voila, to use a French phrase, the germs disappear. And one of those flasks that he does that experiment in can still be seen to this day completely empty of any germs whatsoever. So not only is he able to prove that germs are all around us, he is able to prove that there are more germs in densely populated areas than sparsely populated ones, and he can prove how to get rid of germs. And he publishes his findings in the year 1861. If you decide that you are only going to learn one date from the medicine course, which I wouldn't recommend, but if you are going to just remember one date, let it be this one. This is such a significant turning point. Remember, we were talking before about Edward Jenner. Jenner can't explain why his work works because he can't explain why vaccination works because he doesn't know about germs. Now that Louis Pasteur can prove that germs exist, he is able to apply that thinking to vaccination. So this is a significant turning point. And this is why so many people see Louis Pasteur as such a significant individual in our study. But before we get carried away, Louis Pasteur, as we have mentioned, is a scientist and not a doctor. So he could not apply his germ theory, which is what he publishes in 1861, to human disease. He knew that there must be a link. He knew that there must be a link between germs and human disease. But because he wasn't a doctor, he wasn't able to do that. His specialism was working in the food and liquid industries. So, for instance, he applied his theory to milk. That is why we have pasteurized milk. That's where it comes from. He also applied it to work, working with alcohol as well. And later he does um, work with animals. Uh, for instance, he's uh, employed by uh, the silk industry to help understand better about illness in silkworms. And 
yes, it's important that we realise that, yeah, Louis Pasteur is incredibly significant to discover germs, but he does not make that connection between germs and human disease. He knows there must be one, but he can't make the link. This guy, however, is going to help us out with that. Uh, this is Robert Koch. His name is pronounced Robert Koch, but I, I just can't bring myself to do it. I'm sorry. It's, it's the juvenile in me, I'm afraid. Um, he is a German doctor and he is going to take Louis Pasteur's work and he's going to make it even better. So, yep, Robert Koch is a German doctor who improved on Pasteur's germ theory. And what he does this, uh, what he does, excuse me, is he comes up with a process uh, involving dye to identify individual bacteria. So he is able to identify which germs cause specific diseases. We're going to look at this uh, diagram next to explain that a little bit further. Again, this is gone into detail in the individual's video as well. So let's imagine this shelf here represents the findings of Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur is able to tell us that germs exist. Okay. But because he is a scientist, not a doctor, he cannot apply this to humans. Let's now have a look at Robert Koch. And let's imagine we have a shelf for his discoveries. Koch, however, is able to say that there are more than one types of germ. Pasteur believes there's only one type of germ. Koch says, no, that's not true. Specific illnesses have specific germs. So, for instance, here he has identified uh, the yellow germs, for instance, in this diagram, um, are the ones that cause tuberculosis. The blue ones are the ones that cause cholera. The pink ones are the ones that cause plague. Um, he discovers many, many more than just those three. But nonetheless, I'm hoping we get the idea. So Koch is able to put germs into different groups. He works out a way to say which germs cause which diseases. And as a doctor, he can make the connection between germs and human disease. So I find that little visual really, really helpful in understanding that further. So Robert Koch, a German doctor improved on Pasteur's germ theory, comes up with a process of identifying individual bacteria. And he does that through using dye and he examines it through a microscope. Pasteur is doing a lot of work with microscopes as well, understandably, trying to identify bacteria. You can't see it with the human eye. You'd need to really kind of get there with these more powerful microscopes. Great example of the impact of science and technology at this time. The improvements in the, uh, the making of glass, because that's essentially what you need. You need powerful magnifiers and, uh, and the better understandings of how mirrors work as well help us to be able to make these much more sophisticated microscopes. If you want more on microscopes, definitely speak to a science teacher. It is not where my specialism lies whatsoever. To test this theory, he experiments on mice. And not only does he experiment on just a couple of mice, he experiments on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mice. And he is very insistent to his team that any experiments that they conduct are repeated several times before any discoveries are confirmed. So just because it happens once, Robert Koch isn't satisfied with that. It needs to have happened several times until it can be said, yes, this is definitely what is happening. Koch uses his uh, technique. Uh, he uses dye, for instance, like I said, to identify. And he also um, takes uh, Pasteur's work a stage further. Remember, I said Pasteur was doing a lot of his work on uh, bacteria in liquids. Um, Koch works out a way that you can work with bacteria on a solid form, which is a lot, lot easier to work with. Uh, so, for instance, if you've ever worked with an agar plate in science, that kind of jelly uh, as such, that is along the lines of what Robert Koch is able to develop for people to be able to properly experiment and work with and identify bacteria. So Koch uses that dyeing process and that solid medium uh, to help develop specific vaccines for specific illnesses, because that's the case. Once you know what a disease is, you can start to work out ways to prevent it, perhaps through inoculation. But Koch knows that vaccination is a lot, lot safer. So they're able to develop uh, vaccines for specific illnesses. As well as this, when you know the germ that causes an illness, you can start to experiment on how to get rid of that illness. So it enables you to make preventions and it enables you to make cures. If we think about it, if Pasteur was right and there was only one type of germ, how many different vaccines would we need? One. We'd only need one. 
because all, all germs are, are the same, according to Louis Pasteur. Koch proves this is wrong and that actually you need specific vaccines for specific illnesses. And that's going to spill over into treatment in the 20th century when we start to get work with antibiotics like penicillin. At this time in the industrial era, they haven't got, quite got the scientific know-how or the technology to be able to understand how to get rid of bacteria. They are very much, they're kind of doing like the Greeks did. They're pointing out the problem. OK, they're pointing out the problem, but they're not quite at the stage yet where they're able to actually work out how do we get rid of this problem. An overlap now into the factor of war. Pasteur and Koch were rivals. Uh, Pasteur, French, Koch was German. And during the 1870s, the early 1870s, both France and Germany or the, uh, the district of Prussia uh, were at war with each other. This was a huge, huge war. And France and Prussia and Germany really as a whole uh, have had long term uh, issues between each other. Um, at the time in the 1870s, Germany is not a united country. It is individual states. And Prussia was by far the strongest of that. And the strength of Prussia starts way, way back in the Middle Ages. Um, but Germany does unite as a country following on from the Franco-Prussian War. That's a bit of an aside. The point is that their governments, the French and the German governments, were willing to give Pasteur and Koch, respectively, money to be able to further their research because they wanted to be able to get one up on each other, not just on the battlefield, but in uh, in the field of science as well. Uh, incidentally, uh, in case you are unaware, France loses the Franco-Prussian War and Germany punishes them incredibly harshly and almost well, kind of humiliates them, really, in the aftermath of that. Next, we're going to bring it back to British medical history developments, and we're going to be having a look at an individual called Joseph Lister. Joseph Lister is going to be an individual we're looking at in the realms of surgery, uh, specifically antiseptics. And we're also going to see how his discoveries in regards to surgery are then brought on to other areas of life as well. So Lister was a fan of Louis Pasteur's germ theory. Lister is doing his work after Pasteur's germ theory. Again, get that chronology in place. This, that is the turning point in our thinking. So Lister is aware that infection happened when germs entered broken skin. And what he wants to do is how can I stop that from happening? So what he did was he worked on a chemical barrier and he used a chemical compound called carbolic acid. Now, nowadays, to stop germs from entering broken skin, we would use something like a plaster, for instance, if it was just a small wound. But that kind of technology wasn't around at that time. However, during the industrial era, there is a lot, a lot of developments in regards to chemicals, how they're put together and how they can best be worked with. And so instead, what he wanted to do was to put a chemical barrier that would prevent germs from entering. And the idea would be that, in a way, this barrier would kill off the germs. So we're starting to think about this idea of how we can get rid of germs from getting into the body in the first place. Again, we're specialising mainly in surgery here, not just like kind of daily wounds. So the idea would be that while surgery was going on, uh, they would be using the carbolic acid to stop the germs from getting in. First off, surgeons would be told to soak their hands in the carbolic acid and to wash all of the instruments that they would use in the carbolic acid as well. Uh, think about the name, carbolic acid. This was incredibly painful for a surgeon to do over a long time. And indeed, a lot of surgeons uh, got lots of cracks and things like that in their skin and very, very painful hands from having to do it. We know that nowadays that hygiene in uh, surgical procedures is incredibly common. If you've ever watched things like Casualty or Holby City or you've seen scenes of surgery in other programmes or you've maybe witnessed it yourself in some way, I don't know. You will know that they spend quite some time. Uh, it's called scrubbing up before the surgery begins. And not only are they washing their hands, they go right the way down their forearms to their elbows as well, despite the fact that all of that will be covered up. So. We do see the later impacts of that, but at the time that was a real new suggestion. 
And what Lister even suggested was is that this carbolic acid would be sprayed over the patient during surgery. So let's imagine, say, you are having surgery done on your stomach. The idea would be that the uh, spray would be going over the top of your stomach and where the wound and the incision would be made. Um, that made surgery very wet and very, very slippery indeed. And again, it's an acid. It's not like they're spraying water over the top. You're working with an acid. Lister publishes his findings in 1867 and he is doing this. Let's have a look. 1861. So we're looking six years after Louis Pasteur's germ theory. Now, um, this is something I go into more detail in the indi individuals video about. But just as a bit of a flashback to Pasteur, despite the fact he can prove it, his ideas are not picked up straight away. Again, much like we saw with uh, the likes of William Harvey, for instance, during the Renaissance. Just because you can prove it doesn't mean people are automatically going to change their ideas. It's going to take quite some time to change the habits of hundreds and hundreds, nay, thousands of years. So much like a lot of the individuals that we are studying at the moment, we have a lot of repetition. So it doesn't just happen once and he thinks, oh, I've done it. He repeats it several times. 11 successful results of using carbolic acid to prevent infection from happening. One of the famous ones that he does is um, uh, with a boy called Jamie Greenlease, and he is knocked over by a cart. Uh, and normally his leg uh, being as damaged and cut up as it was, uh, would have had would have been amputated because they knew with all of the cuts and everything that were on his leg um, that essentially his leg would become infected, it would become gangrenous and they would have to amputate it anyway. So let's just uh, skip out the middle man before it gets gangrenous. Let's chop off the leg. And it says, no, don't do that. I'm going to come up with something different. I want to test out this carbolic acid I've been working with. And what he does is he soaks the bandages for Jamie's leg in the carbolic acid and he wraps them round his legs and keeps them in place. Um, I think they're kept in place for about three weeks initially and then the bandages are removed. And what he notices is that essentially his skin is raw and therefore he understands that actually the acid is too strong. So he goes back to the drawing board and he weakens the acid and, and all of that kind of jazz, soaks the bandages again and uh, wraps up the leg. It's left for a little bit longer. And after I think about six weeks, the wound uh, it is the bandages sorry are taken off and it is revealed that the wounds have healed and there is no infection or anything like that so lucky old jamie greenlace thanks to being a guinea pig here uh doesn't end up having his leg amputated so as we can see it's all about being able to prove what you have found um, as I've kind of suggested previously, surgeons weren't particularly keen on working with carbolic acid. It wasn't a pleasant liquid to work with. And also Lister kept changing his ideas. Um, the more you experiment with something, the more you have to adjust. You don't do exactly the same thing over and over again. You start to tweak things ever so slightly. And um, because Lister was making such big changes, people were like, do you even really know what you're doing? And the truth probably was, actually, no, I don't. I do have a, you know, quite strong indication of what I'm doing. But that's the whole point of trial and error. You know, that's the whole point of unwrapping that boy's bandages after three weeks and noticing that the acid was far too strong to be doing any good. So whilst we can maybe see a rational understanding to the idea of trial and error, at the time, surgeons were very quick to kind of jump uh, on him and say, nope, sorry, you don't know what you're doing. Move along. And we noticed that eventually... Lister gets the last word. And by 19, sorry, 1890s, uh, the attitudes to the use of antiseptics have changed dramatically. And this is because we've now got decades for people to get more and more used to the concept of germs. And also we've got the work of Robert Koch as well, helping out to kind of take germ theory to the next level. And suddenly lots of things are starting to come together. Lots of things are starting to make sense. And what we start to notice in the late industrial era, moving into the modern era, is that we start to get aseptic surgery and how they are making moves to remove germs from surgery altogether. Well, before this, surgery was just a whole microcosm of germs going on. You know, there weren't um, surgeons would wear their own clothes. They wouldn't be washing their hands. Um, instruments wouldn't be washed in between patients or anything like that. Uh, for instance, unless your saw that you were using to hack off someone's leg, um, you know, wasn't sorry, was too soaked in blood that it was unable to cut through properly. Maybe then they might try and remove it. But there was no indication of that. You'd have lots of people present for surgery as well. And also 
um, you would have had not only people present where the surgery was actually taking place, but you'd have a lot of people watching as well. This is why the locations where surgery took place were known as operating theatres, because people would sit around and look down on what was happening to learn better about how to perform surgery. But you could even just go along as a member of the public to watch as well. So lots and lots of developments, but it takes those decades for people to start to understand the ideas. Luckily, in the late 1800s, communication has improved significantly, so ideas are spreading a lot, lot quicker. So this is a real nice example of lots of different individuals coming together. But what I do want to make very, very clear is that we are still dealing with stopping germs from entering the body um, in a kind of visual way. We're dealing with infections on the surface. We are not at this stage dealing with infection deep inside the body. That's when we'll get to antibiotics. That's when we'll get to the likes of penicillin. One thing I haven't mentioned here, but I said I would at the beginning of this little bit on Joseph Lister, is that his findings are used to start to produce products to make people's homes cleaner. Things like uh, detergents to wash with, uh, that you wash your houses with rather than just using water. The idea of using soap products, for instance, to be able to have a more cleanly household. And a lot of them were attributed to Lister. Many of them were even named after him as well. There are three main issues in surgery that need to be solved. Infection is one, blood loss is another, and that problem is not going to be solved until the 20th century in modern medicine. But the last problem is that with pain, and that's where anaesthetics come into it. We're going to look now at James Simpson. Now, unlike Joseph Lister, who discovers something completely new in developing surgery, anaesthetics have already been around. So James Simpson is just improving on ideas that already exist. Before the work of James Simpson, natural herbal anaesthetics had been used uh, with mixed results. We talked in the medieval medicine one, for instance, about opium and hemlock, uh, which had potentially fatal results if they were given in too strong a dosage. Uh, another form of anaesthetic that was often used was giving people alcohol, was making them drunk. But the problem with giving people alcohol uh, and making them so drunk that they are either effectively pass out or they are completely unaware of what's going on is that alcohol speeds up your heart rate. And so it pumps your blood around your body a lot faster. And why that's important is if you uh, get cut, for instance, or, you know, you have surgery performed, um, you will lose blood very, very quickly. So it was not a safe thing whatsoever. Early examples of chemical anaesthetics can be seen in the early 1800s with Humphrey Davy, who uses laughing gas or nitrous oxide as a chemical anaesthetic. Uh, this was just what we would describe as a local anaesthetic. It doesn't put you out completely. Uh, um, anaesthetics that put you to sleep completely are called general anaesthetics. So uh, nitrous oxide is just a superficial anaesthetic. Uh, laughing gas, it was uh, something you would inhale to make you feel a bit giddy as such. Definitely not strong enough to perform complicated operations. Um, Laughing gas nitrous oxide uh, is often used in uh, dentistry or has been used in the past in dentistry to perform dental procedures. To improve on the uh, nitrous oxide that was used by Humphrey Davy, another chemical element, uh, sorry, chemical anaesthetic that was used in the early 1800s uh, was ether. Now, ether worked a lot better than nitrous oxide did in regards to kind of making people go a bit doolally, uh, but it had significant side effects. Um, it caused vomiting, which is not particularly helpful to have someone chucking up if you're trying to perform surgery on them. And also it was highly flammable, which is very important at a time when most people are performing surgery by candlelight. So not a great solution. Enter James Simpson in 1847. Now, I know I've talked about this after we've talked about Joseph Lister, but I just want to make it aware that the developments with anaesthetics come before developments with antiseptics. So the problem of pain in surgery is solved before the problem of infection. In 1847, James Simpson is able to discover a more effective anaesthetic than ether and nitrous oxide, and he discovers it completely by chance. He's experimenting with chemicals to find out an effective anaesthetic, and he accidentally knocks over a flask full of chloroform. And essentially what happens is that the flask is knocked over and the fumes from uh, the, the chemical are in the room and he and his colleagues are knocked out completely and they fall asleep. 
And when they come round, they realise what's happened. And they also realise, unlike Ether, there were no immediate side effects. So he was pretty satisfied, James Simpson, that he had discovered a decent chemical anaesthetic, which had apparently no short term side effects. There was some opposition to this. Um, for instance, just jumping on the side effects side of things, yes, he was able to identify there were no short term side effects, but he couldn't attest to uh, whether there are only long term side effects from chloroform. That would take time. We have religious opposition to anaesthetics, and this is something that would have been around in general. This is not a new one that would have existed, but um, for instance, it was the idea that pain comes from God. You know, if you are in pain, it's because God has sent that pain to you. Uh, a good example of that, for instance, is the pain that women experience during childbirth. Nothing to do with the idea of, you know, trying to shove something the size of a melon out of something the size of like a five to ten p piece. But the idea that you um, women experience pain in childbirth because of the original sin committed by Eve in the Garden of Eden. So there was a strong connection in religious belief that pain came from God. Uh, I've not mentioned it on here as well, but within the military, it was also almost seen as part of your military duty to be able to endure pain. It was your role as a soldier to be strong enough to endure pain and, um, and anaesthetics would be seen as a sign of weakness. Uh, a bit of bad press, a kind of extreme example. Um, a girl called Hannah Greener had a, was having a simple toe operation and had chloroform used uh, and she died during the operation. Uh, be it to do with the uh, the chloroform is probably quite likely because the operation was so simple, it's unlikely she would have died from what happened in the operation. But clearly the right levels of chloroform weren't used. If you think about something which is designed to put you to sleep, if you use too much of it, of course, it's going to have fatal consequences. Queen Victoria, however, was a massive fan of chloroform and she used it in the uh, the birth of her. I believe it was the son of her, uh, her son, Duke Leopold. Um, Queen Victoria had tons of children, so um, experimenting during childbirth was something that she had a lot of experience with, you could argue. And she was a big fan. And because people were like, well, if it's OK for Queen Victoria, then I'm happy to use chloroform uh, during childbirth and in other situations as well for surgery. Being able to put somebody under comfortably meant that surgery could now be carried out for longer and also more complicated operations could take place as well. Uh, previously, uh, before the use of decent anaesthetics like chloroform, uh, essentially someone would have to be held down for the duration and told to bite onto something uh, and scream through the pain uh, of what was happening. And that meant that operations happened very, very quickly. Uh, there's one example of um, a man who, uh, before anaesthetics were properly used like chloroform, uh, a guy who was having his leg amputated, who, as well as that happening, also got his testicles chopped off as well because the surgery had to be performed so quickly because he was squirming around so much in so much pain. So um, there we go. Now surgery can be done for a lot longer. We've also got a lot more uh, opportunities for more complicated surgery, opportunities to go deeper inside the body to perform surgery. But remember, we are dealing with a time before germs and bef sorry before knowledge of germs excuse me and before we're working with antiseptics so what we start to notice is that actually the death rates in surgery increase because infection is being carried deeper into the body so yay on the one hand people aren't in pain boo on the other hand because we're getting a lot of infections being carried deeper into the body before we have effective use of antiseptics Next, we're going to move on to public health and the role of government in medicine during Britain in the industrial era. And this is a great source to look at to determine the, uh, the problems with public health. Uh, I don't know how clearly you can make it out, but the date on the, uh, the source there on the right hand side is 1859, 1859, a court for King Cholera. So we're talking a date before we're aware of germs. But clearly there is an awareness If this picture here is to represent why cholera happens. We can see people are understanding a lot to do with dirty conditions and also overcrowding as well. We're going to look at cholera specifically now and we're going to look at John Snow, who is the man who discovers the true cause of cholera. Cholera was another killer disease of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it was kind of more prevalent at a time when uh, smallpox was dying down, if you will. And again, uh, when towns were becoming more and more populated. 
So cholera was another killer disease of the Industrial Revolution. In 1848 alone, 14,000 people were killed from cholera. And like I said, overcrowding did not help. Probably worth mentioning now, if you're unaware, how do you catch cholera? Because you can still get cholera today. Highly unlikely for us to get it in this country. But for instance, in the likes of refugee camps in, in areas uh, that are hit by natural disasters, cholera can become very, very common because you catch it from drinking contaminated water. Uh, water that has been contaminated from sewage supplies. And this was incredibly common during the industrial era. John Snow does some research into why there are so many people dying of cholera in London, specifically in the Broad Street area of London. And in this small area, 700 people died in one year from cholera. And John Snow wanted to understand better why that was the case. And through studies, through looking at data, he was able to track the disease to one particular water pump in Broad Street where people would go to to get their water. And he noticed that this water pump was next to a leaking sewer. And what he did was he removed the handle from the water pump so people couldn't get water anymore from it. And he noticed that the deaths from cholera stopped. Again, John Snow is an individual I go into more detail about in the Individuals in Medicine video, so feel, feel free to check that out. So in 1854, John Snow is able to prove that dirty water, water causes cholera, but it is before germ theory, so he can't prove that is why it happens. Um, we know that in the medieval times, people didn't drink dirty water because of how disgusting it looked and smelt, but in the industrial era, people are coming into contact with and actually consuming this water a lot, lot more. So he's able to say to people, look, stop drinking this water because it's making you sick. And people aren't believing him. And little attention is paid to his findings because it's before he's able to say, stop drinking this water, it's making you sick because of all the germs that are inside it. Instead, John Snow is doing his work at a time when that miasma theory is still really, really strong. They're like, no, it's nothing to do with me drinking this water. It's to do with how bad the water smells. It's to do with how bad everything smells around here because yet yeah, industrial towns were also absolutely rancid. So really unfortunate to Jon Snow, real frustration. And again, another example of how it takes a little bit of time for it to catch on. Snow's findings are further helped 30 years later, when Robert Koch is able to actually identify the specific germ which causes cholera and therefore creates a vaccine for it as well. Now, one of the easy ways I make the connection is that I think of, I know that cholera is from dirty water and I know that snow is effectively rain, which is effectively water. So that's how I make the little connection in my brain to do with that. So again, I go into a lot more detail about Jon Snow and how he made his discoveries in that Individuals in Medicine video, which you may want to check out. We're going to look more now into how the government was becoming more aware of the problems with public health and with the poor. And we're going to start off by looking at this individual here, Edwin Chadwick. In 1842, Edwin Chadwick conducts a report into the living conditions of the poor and he notices that their health needed to be improved. Uh, Edwin Chadwick, I haven't mentioned this here, but he worked for the government and it, he was doing the government's work in this report. So it wasn't like he was just a randomer who uh, kind of put all of this together. He was doing this on behalf of the government. And Chadwick makes suggestions about what can be done. And again, this is something I go into more detail in the individuals in, in medicine video that you may want to check out. And he's kind of talking to a brick wall in a way because he's talking to people at a time when the poor were criticised for being lazy and work shy. So, for instance, when Chadwick is saying, gosh, these poor people are living in absolutely terrible conditions, a lot of people would turn around, the rich and wealthy of, this, of society would turn around and say, well, yeah, of course they are. That's their own fault. If they worked harder, they would probably get more money and afford to live in better conditions, which is generally the attitude that was around at the time. In his report, Chadwick doesn't only identify the problems, but he comes up with solutions. And he recommends that a board of health should be set up to wash the streets and supply fresh, clean running water 
for people. Check out that date, 1842. This is before Jon Snow is doing his discoveries into cholera. And that should give you a bit of an indication here that Edwin Chadwick is saying this, what, 13 years? No, is it 13? No, sorry. 12 years before Jon Snow is able to make the connection between dirty water and cholera. That will give you an indication of just how seriously Chadwick's ideas were taken, i.e. not very seriously at all. He also supported this idea that medical officers should check that this was actually being done. And the government did not like this when he came back with these findings. They felt it was a waste of money. The way they'd have to pay for this would be through taxes. And we're talking at a time here, 1842, before working class men have the vote. So it would be the rich people in society that would have to pay through their taxes to improve the lives of the poor. And the rich people would not be fans of that whatsoever. And the MPs, the members of parliament, were amongst these rich, wealthy classes. And back to their laissez-faire attitude, it's not our problem to deal with the poor. They saw any improvements that Chadwick suggested as a waste of money. You may well be thinking, but hang on, didn't you just say that Chadwick was sent by the government to find out about this stuff? Yeah, you're absolutely right. But they were, they were, he wasn't sent to do it because they were concerned with the lives of poor people. He was sent because they wanted to understand how they could get poor people to work harder, how they could make more money for the country. His report does, however, influence the Public Health Act of 1848. So six years later, the government actually put something in writing to suggest the idea about boards of health. But it was exactly that. It was just a suggestion. In 1848, any public health measures were voluntary. And if a local council decided, yeah, do you know what, I don't think I will do any of that, then they wouldn't bother. They wouldn't bother whatsoever. And it was only suggestion. So the government, if you decided, for instance, your local council, your local MP said, we're not going to do that, then the government would not do anything about it. We're going to understand better now how our government in the industrial era moves from having a bit of a laissez-faire attitude to public health to making it something that is compulsory and something which affects everybody in the country. So the 1848 Public Health Act was voluntary. Like I said, you didn't have to do it if you didn't want to. And as you can probably imagine, most local councils didn't bother. So boards of health were set up. The government could suggest improvements, suggest taxes for public health improvements, and councils could appoint medical officers if they wanted to, but they did not have to. Then in 1875, we have a compulsory Public Health Act. And what happens is all of the suggestions that are made earlier, so all of those suggestions that are there in point two, are made compulsory. In 1875, local authorities have to put these measures in place. Why is there a change? It is because in 1867, working class men get the vote. And when that happens, there is an end to that laissez-faire attitude. Now that the vast majority of your population can now vote, you need to make sure that you are doing things to make their lives better so that they will want to vote for you. So if you want poor people to vote for you, then you have to be do sorry, then you have to do something that's going to be in it for them. You have to do something that's going to improve their lives. Also, we've got other medical developments that are helping as well between 1848 and 1875. Uh, we've got John Snow's work on cholera, past germ theory. Koch's work and Lister's work as well all show a movement to better understanding of germs and the importance of hygiene and cleanliness by 1875. So lots of factors are going on. Lots of events are happening between 1848 and 1875. Uh, we've also got um, in there the work of Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole uh, in the Crimean War in the 1850s, where they look at health and hygiene in hospitals. Uh, again, working before germ theory as well. So we've got working class men getting the vote. Don't understand that. Sorry, don't underestimate how important that is. That was of significant importance because now the government can't just ignore the working class. They have to do something to help. Otherwise, they won't vote for them. And at this time, the majority of the population are made up of the working class. You can't just rely on the votes of the rich anymore. Now, the majority of the population are the working class. So if you want to stay in power, you've got to do things to make their lives better. Then as well as that, like I've said in that point five, we get lots of developments in our understanding of germs and cleanliness and hygiene as well. 
we can see the impact here that public health measures has on the death rates from cholera in particular. That's one of the main diseases at this time we can link to poor hygiene. As you can see, before 1848, when that Voluntary Public Health Act is put in place, we have got a rapid increase in uh, deaths from cholera. And this is happening also because at this time in the early 1800s, we are getting that rapid increase in population and overcrowding developing in the industrial towns where cholera was absolutely rife. Then we can see just how significant the Public Health Act of 1848 was. Yes, I stand by what I said before. Not many councils imposed public health measures when it was voluntary, but clearly some of them did. And it had an impact. And we see that rapid decline in deaths from cholera as well. Then we can see 1854, when John Snow makes the discovery of the true cause of cholera, we start to see a gradual decline in death rates from cholera as well. Uh, this graph only goes up to 1865, but you, I'm sure you can imagine if we went further into 1875, into the 1900s, we would see that line tail off massively, lower and lower and lower, especially when those public health measures become compulsory. In our last point, we are now going to be having a look at why we start to get an actual physical public health system developed. And by that, I mean like a sewage system, uh, a way to carry waste away underground in tunnels uh, and also to provide clean water as well. And as with many events in history, the government only tends to do something uh, about things that are affecting other people when it starts to directly influence them. For instance, they only start to uh, look at things that affect the lives of the poor when the poor are able to vote. Here is another good example of that. In the summer of 1858, we have an event known as the Great Stink. And what happens is the summer of 1858 was a scorcher. And what that does is it essentially makes the River Thames smell incredibly bad. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where heat is applied to poor, like to bad smell, to waste, but it's pretty rank. It's disgusting. And remember, we're dealing with a time here when pretty much everybody's waste went into the River Thames. So it kind of heats it up. It makes it like a kind of disgusting soup in a way. Uh, and the smell is so bad that Parliament has to move from Westminster to another location away from the River Thames. Uh, think about the Houses of Parliament, uh, the Elizabeth Tower with Big Ben inside it. That is right on the banks of the River Thames. And yeah, the smell was so bad that they had to move. They had to move Parliament to elsewhere. And again, as soon as it starts directly impacting them, they realise something needs to be done about it. The government realises something needs to be done about it. So they ask somebody called, and this is my most favourite name for our entire medicine study. I absolutely love it. Joseph Bazalgette. Joseph, Joseph Jazzlejet. <laughs> Let's try that one again. Sorry, everybody. Joseph Bazalgette. I was getting too excited about how much I love that guy's name. Had already drawn up plans for a sophisticated sewage system in London. He'd already presented it to the government and they were like, yeah, it looks too expensive. We're not interested. And now suddenly it's affecting them. Someone's like probably behind a, behind like a, 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 a handkerchief or maybe with their noses pinched saying, uh, do you remember that guy, Joseph Bazalgette, uh, who came up with those plans for a sewage system? Perhaps now is a good time that we can maybe look at those plans in a bit more detail. And the government gives him three million pounds to start immediately building his sewage system. Okay, his underground tunnels. It was incredibly sophisticated and it involves a lot of mathematical and scientific thinking that I don't even nearly understand. It looks, for instance, at principles to do with gravity and what kind of degree of slope there needed to be. What, uh, oh, I think it's called a gradient, isn't it? Yeah, what gradient uh, the slopes needed to be in the sewage systems to effectively help have gravity do its job to carry the sewage away. And this sewage system was finished in 1866 and extended 83 miles and was capable of removing 420 gallons of sewage every single day. And this was in London, by the way. This sewage system was done in London and later it's rolled out to other um, condensed, uh, sorry, highly populated and densely populated areas of the country as well. And 
So significant was the development that he made in producing these sewers that after the sewers are officially opened, because that's what has, needs to happen, they're not like kind of gradually introduced, you have to have them officially opened in 1866, cholera never ever returns to London ever again. And with that, the life expectancy of poor people began to increase. That along with, in 1875, the compulsory public health measures, that along with increased vaccination as well, starts to see the life expectancy of poor people improved. Um, I didn't actually include it in this, uh, in this video, but um, when I teach about um, the beginnings of public health in the industrial era, one of the things that often really shocks people is to learn that if you were of the working class in an urban area, in a city in the early 1800s, your life expectancy was 16 years old. That's as, that is as, as old as you expected to live. And that really, really shocks people, especially when you look to see that in comparison to that, the rich members of, the, of society in the rural areas were living into their 40s and their 50s. So this is a significant long term difference. So to say that a cholera never comes back is a huge statement to make, considering that so many people were dying of this disease during the industrial era. And that's it. Now, don't get me wrong. I know this is a long video at one hour and just over now 10 minutes, but I genuinely thought it was going to be a lot, lot longer. Thank you so much for staying with me through this. I really hope, as always, you found it useful. I hope you found it interesting as well, if you had a little extra historical tidbits in there for you. Uh, I hope there were times when you were hearing what I was talking about and saying, yeah, do you know what? I know this because, yeah, you do know this. This is stuff that you have been taught. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can get updates. Don't forget to like the videos as well, because that gives me a real good indication when you like the videos as to where uh, I have been the most help. And I can kind of analyse the videos better and understand what works and what isn't working. As well as that, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram as well. You can find me at One History Help. I would say at the moment I'm more active on Instagram than I am on Twitter. And I seem to be having a lot more followers there than I am on, on Instagram than I am on Twitter. So there's lots of things going on on there. For instance, I do uh, my Instagram live broadcasts where I revise specific individual areas that you have requested. So by all means, come and check me out on there. Follow along. And I like, like to put links to lots of other historical goings on, um, maybe that are relevant to what's happening in our world at the moment, but also to do with different areas of the GCSE as well. And finally, you can find me also on Facebook. Search for One History Help and you'll find my page from there. Thank you very much again for joining me, everybody, and I will see you very, very soon for our next video. The next one is going to be on modern medicine, the final of four videos in our study of medicine through time or words of that effect. Thanks, everybody. Bye.